Hello and welcome to this first law breakdown of episode 1 of my own take on how a second aid show should be like. If you haven't watched the episode yet, I recommend you to pause now and watch it first. Or you can open another window and watch it scene by scene along with this video. Before we begin, I want to point out that there might be some law elements I won't explain in detail in this video. Also keep in mind that explaining the law will include some spoilers. Of course not all what's going to happen, but at least some of it. I've also made a recap video where I dive into some other aspects I won't cover in this video, so feel free to check that out as well. Let's jump right into it and look at the prologue. So this is the very first line we hear. It is said that in the beginning, the world was created in the great song of the Ainur, called Ainur Lindale. So I've started with the in the beginning, which to some might sound like the beginning of the Rings of Power, where Galadriel's voiceover says that nothing is evil in the beginning. That's an actual quote by Elrond, in the Lord of the Rings book, when he speaks at the council. And it is in fact about Sauron, but we will get back to that at some point, as I actually plan to use that line myself. Now, I haven't done this to mimic the Rings of Power, but instead to mimic the opening of Peter Jackson's trilogy, which also features a voiceover by Galadriel. But in my take, it's actually a voiceover by Elrond, which I also talk about in the recap video. And the rest of the lines about the music of the Ainur, the Ainur Lindale, is of course way more complicated in the lore, and what should be used in a prologue like this. First of all, there were three themes, which I decided not to include, as going too deep into the lore so early on will just scare away a lot of people. A rule of thumb for writing is actually not to start off with a huge info dump. Not that Tolkien cared to follow it, but he's quite the unique exception. I also didn't mention a lot about Eru. I wanted it to remain a bit of a mystery, but we will get back to him as he will come up a few times throughout these five seasons. The entire song is about the creation of the world, and in the prologue it's very brief and not too detailed. I bring up that Manwe was the greatest in authority and king of the Ainur, while his brother Melkor was the most powerful of them, which is from the law of course. There's actually a handful of lines from the Silmarillion I decided to use, so it's very close to how Tolkien would explain it, at least to some extent. I have excluded some things of course, to make it less complicated and to get the story going. And I've made a few changes here and there to better explain certain things. I also mention the discord of Melkor, but here I'm not going into detail either, as Melkor won't really be the villain in this series. So I think it's better to be a little brief and dwell more on the servants he had, as they will be the antagonists of this entire show. And next I mentioned that Morgoth built his fortress in the far north of the world. Originally, I was going to include his name, Utumno, but again, it complicates things just a tiny bit more and I don't want to bombard viewers with new names and places from the get-go, so instead it might be brought up and named in a later episode. I don't think it is important to remember the name early on, so we can always introduce it later on. And that's the case with many things, actually. He created many foul beings never seen before. This line is of course about the orcs, but also covers other creatures Morgoth created, like dragons. There are some other creatures, like vampires, whose origin isn't explained, at least not to my knowledge, Perhaps he created those as well. They won't really play a part in the show, however. And other evils he allied. So the other evils he allied refers to Ungoliant, an evil spirit in the form of a massive spider. She came from Avatha, in the southeastern regions of Aman, and of course allied Morgoth in his attack on the two trees of Valinor. She helped him infiltrate Valinor by shrouding both herself and Morgoth in webs of pure darkness. Once within Valinor, Ungoliant drank the light from the two trees after Morgoth wounded them with his spear. This led to the darkening of Valinor. Ungoliant also drained dry the worlds of Varda, so that nothing remained of the light of the two lamps, save that of the Silmarils of Feanor. After this terrible act, Ungoliant and Melkor fled to Middle-earth, to escape justice at the hands of the Valar. And as many of you know, Morgoth didn't want to hand over the Silmarils to her, so she tried to devour him, but his Balrogs came to help him. And Ungoliant will actually be mentioned later in this episode, but she won't be included. But let's say she still plays a role, somehow. So Ungulian won't be in this show, but we will discover her fate after this event, and you should expect to see a spider at some point at least. So now I have warned you. But Ungulian isn't the only ally of Morgoth. He also used the Balrogs, though I would rather say he dominated them. Evil spirits that served him early on, with hearts of fire and cloaked in darkness, as we can read in the Silmarillion. And no, they didn't have wings. Now there are of course also men that Morgoth corrupted, and who served under him, which is also something we will see 
Sauron do in these five seasons. But that brings us to, of course, Sauron, one of the Maya who also served on the Morgoth. He will be the main antagonist in this entire Second Age show, but his identity is not known early on. But it's what Season 1 is all about. Sauron's return and the elves discovering who's behind this rising evil. Next we hear that Melkor took a new name, Morgoth, the Black Foe. It's a Sindarin name given to him by Fëanor and can also mean Dark Tyrant. And if we return to the prologue again, I mentioned briefly the Wars of Beleriand that ended with the War of Wrath, a great battle that lasted for more than four decades. I also mentioned that Morgoth was imprisoned in the Void beyond return, which to some may sound like he will return, but not in this show. I feel the Rings of Power forgot to mention what actually happened to Morgoth, but there were likely some issues with the rights for that. In this show, however, I want to focus on this aspect, but the servants of Morgoth fled from the battle and hidden dark corners of Middle-earth. Many that hear that will think of Sauron right away, but it also includes the Balrogs that fled and hid deep underground. We only know of Durin's Bane that awoke in Casa Doom in the Third Age in 1980, which for some dumb reason will be featured in the Rings of Power. It will not be featured in this show, so calm down. But I have been thinking about including a Balrog in another way, but it is playing with some bits of lore, at least in a poetic sense. But I will keep it secret for now. There were also dragons that fled the War of Wrath, Many fled to the north and will later come down to Middle-earth in the later Third Age, where especially the dwarves had trouble with them. Will I include dragons in the show? Well, let's just say it's very plausible. But it will always be tied to some lore. And of course, as I briefly mentioned, spiders, the spawn of Ungoliant. I can guarantee you that they will be in the show, even in this first season. I won't reveal more for now, but watch the entire first season and you will see. You will see. Back to the prologue. I mentioned that the Valar rewarded the Edain that helped in the War of Wrath by lifting an island out of the sea called Elena. This is the island of Numenor. Numenor can both refer to the island itself and the kingdom, of course. Now, I don't actually mention that some of the Druidine went with Elros and the Edain to Numenor, but they did. And it is something we will get back to in a later episode, as they will actually play a part in this show. And lastly, I mentioned that Elros ruled for four centuries and that the kingdom passed on from father to son. Maybe you didn't pick up on this tiny detail, but it's actually quite important. You see, the oldest child of Tar Elendil was Silmarion, his daughter, whose son Valendil would be the first lord of Andunye. And yes, worry not, he will be in the show. The scepter did pass on to his third child, Meneldur, or Irimon, as was his birth name. I will not include the name Irimon, though, as I think that will just confuse people even more. And it's the same case for other characters that might have many, many, many names. I think there's a few exceptions where they will have more than one name, but I've tried to stick with at least one name and then perhaps sometimes mention that they are also called something else. Anyway, this whole idea of excluding daughters from inheriting the throne is something that plays a key part in Eldarion's story. Funny enough, it's also a central element in the House of Dragon, which the Rings of Power have been competing with. While Tolkien and George R. R. Martin are great writers, they are still very different in many ways. So despite this similarity, it would feel extremely different, I think. Anyway, I mention we are in the year 725, during the rule of Tar Elendil, the father of Meneldur and grandfather of Aldarion. Tar Elendil is already a pretty old king at this point, and have been ruling for 135 years. I mention he was beloved by his people and wise with many winces. Now the line, wise with many winters, is actually how Tolkien describes Aragorn when Eowyn meets him. And she now was suddenly aware of him. Tall heirs of kings, wise with many winters, grey cloaked, hiding a power that yet she felt. But not only is it from Tolkien, no, it's actually from the Anglo-Saxon poem Beowulf. And if you know anything about Tolkien, it's that he was a huge fan of Beowulf, and even made a translation of the poem himself. So I included that line on purpose. And while it's a small thing, I think it's stuff like that that feels very Tolkien to many. Now, another interesting thing about Tar Elendil is that he was born in 350 of the Third Age, while Elros was still alive and ruling. In fact, he was the last king of Numenor, who was also alive while Elros still ruled. It's not something we get to explore in this episode, but it really gives him and his role a lot more magnitude knowing that. Let's jump to scene one. The purpose of the first scene is to introduce Numenor and the close relation to the sea, something that will be important throughout the seasons, 
especially for Aldarion playing a part in the first two seasons. It is of course also very important to get to know Aldarion, as he will be the lead protagonist in season 1 for Numenor. But we will see that the Numenor storyline have a lot of different characters over the five seasons. So in each season there will be a new Numenorian protagonist, in a way at least. In this first season there will be a transition where the elves start to become more protagonists in their own storylines, as they will be the characters we will follow from season 1 to 5. We start near Romena, located here at the eastern shores of Numenor, and we can see Ven to his house in the horizon. He was the captain of the king's ships, and was the captain on the first ship when the Numenorians returned to Middle-earth, something also alluded to in Aldarion's questions. I also included a tiny little detail about the birds greeting the mariners as they approach Numenor. Vento mentions it's more than a century ago that he was last in Middle-earth. To be exact, it's 125 years. The reason I've included this was to tell early on that the Numenorians are very long-lived. If you know the lore, that might seem obvious, but there will be people out there that doesn't know. Aldarion mentions the Grey Havens of the Elves and the mountains along the shore. He is, of course, referring to the Grey Havens and Ered Luin. I used the word Elves rather than Eldar early on, but as we get into the story, the word Eldar is used a lot more frequently. Vento mentions that his greatest voyages are behind him, not ahead. He will, though, return to Middle Earth in this episode, but for the last time. I do think his greatest voyage was in 600, when he first came to Grey Havens and befriended Gilgalad. Back then he sailed the ship in Tulesse, which means return. But here he is sailing the ship Numerama, which means West Wings. It's also the ship that brought Aldarion and Vento to Grey Havens, but we will get back to that. Vento mentions that they should return home. Aldarion actually lives with him near Romena, and not with his parents. Vento is the father of Almarion, the mother of Aldarion. And the last note about this first scene. We see a great eagle fly above the ship as the ship is about to dock in Romena. And of course we see the splendor of Numenor, though it's only a shadow of what it will be in later seasons. So let's move on to scene two. This scene is inside the house of Veentur in the evening of the same day. Veentur brings up that Aldarion have been living in his house for years and that he is a skilled captain already. Veentur says the following, Beware of the sea, Aldarion. It has a way of swallowing men and their dreams. Now there are actually two layers to this. The first thing is that it tells us about Veentur himself that he once had a dream to sail the seas and visit distant lands. And this is also something I bring up in the recap. But another layer that I haven't talked about yet is that this is a setup. Something bad will happen at sea, but I won't reveal what it is yet. I actually used a lot of dialogue in this scene from the chapter with Aldarion and Erendis called the Mariner's Wife. And of course I used the word adventure early on, as it's just something that brings to mind the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. It's not a strong connection, but having a last adventure reminds me of Bilbo in The Lord of the Rings and how he wanted to see the mountains one last time. The third scene is with Aldarion riding towards Middledur's tower, which is located close to the mountains around Hill. It's actually a tower Middledur built as he had a great passion for stargazing. So this is where the rest of Aldarion's family lives, his father Middledur, his mother Almarion, and his little sister Idilel, who's around the age of 13 at this time. Aldarion also had an even younger sister called Almiel, but she wasn't born at this point, and we will get back to her. Almiel doesn't really play a rival role in this scene, but she will play an important role down the line, so it's important to mention her from the start, so she doesn't pop into the story out of nowhere. Aldarion gets to the tower and is greeted by his pregnant mother. Now as mentioned, Aldarion has a younger sister called Almiel, but she was first born in 729, so four years later. I decided to make the mother pregnant here, yet again give the impression that the Numenorians live longer than normal men. I thought it was a fine little detail to include, so we know Aldarion has two sisters, and now we might not confuse them so easily. His mother is happy to see him, Menildur, his father, is not too happy with Aldarion's love for the sea. His mother, on the other hand, supports him, at least early on in the story. And that's basically what the whole scene is there for. Menildur becomes an obstacle in the narrative, and in a way, a minor antagonist while Almarion is the loving, supporting mother. For Meneldur, I also reused some dialogue from Don Finish Tales. I'd like to add that the Great Lands mean Middle Earth, in case that was confusing. Also, in the original text, he says Anya, which means sun. I really considered keeping it, but I feared some people might confuse it with his name, especially so early in the story. So I decided to simply replace it with sun in the episode. Alarion then thanks his father, and we hear that he will see the havens of the Eldar, to this time I used the word Eldar instead of Elves. It's a very similar line we have in the first scene, so 
but the idea was to make it a little easier to understand that the elves are called the Eldar, but it's an easy thing to miss. And of course we hear about King Gilgalad, also mentioned by Ventur in the previous scene. Next, Meneldur mentions that Alarion should ask the king for leave. I'm not sure if Tolkien forgot, but Meneldur wasn't the ruling king at the time. That would be Tar Elendil. There are some things in the text that seem to indicate that Tolkien mixed things around. Of course I can't say it's a minor mistake or anything, but I do think it makes sense that the king would have to authorize the second Numenorean voyage to Middle-earth, just like the first one. It also gives us a reason to meet Tar Elendil and learn a lot more about the world through him. Aldarion leaves the room, along with his sister Eilenil. I included this Quenya line for Menildur about his son. I decided to include some Quenya into the story, and gave Menildur this line about his son. A special thanks to Alaran from Vinya Laban Golmore. He's been a huge help with the Quenya and Sindarin in this first episode, so thank you. And Marian brings up that Aldarion will one day be king. It's a central element in the plot for season 1, so we will get back to that at some point. I also included that Menildur fears that he is very different from himself, which is true. Adarian is quite the extraordinary king of Numenor. He truly changed the course of history, not only for Numenor, but in a way for all of Middle-earth. And I think this difference between the characters is what is truly fascinating, but it will of course also lead to a conflict. And the last thing in the scene, before we cut to Menelos, is Menelor laying his hand on Almarian's belly. They talk about the name of the child, Earendur if it's a boy, the same name as Menelor's uncle, the brother of Tar Elendil, who we know very little about. Now, Earendur actually means servant of the sea, so it's a bit of a slap in the face to Menelor, in a way, but disguised as a gesture to his uncle. None of this really happens in the lore, of course, I just found it funny to include it as a side note. Oh, and the name also reminds a lot about Earendil, who will be mentioned a couple of times in this season. In the lore, they actually get a daughter called Almiel, as I mentioned. The meaning of the name isn't exactly lost, but it's suggested to mean blessed daughter, which I try to incorporate into the dialogue. We start the scene in Amenelos, the capital of Numenor. So we have already seen three different locations in Numenor, and it should be clear that it's not some tiny island with just one city, as the Rings of Power seem to indicate. This is the thriving kingdom with the people that populate the whole island. Amenelos was actually only the second largest city on Numenor in the early history, and Dunye was the largest and also a settlement we'll see in a later episode. first thing we see is actually two great eagles flying above the city. I think it connects fine to both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. They're very iconic, and I think many can remember the eagles quite well. They won't play a huge part in the story, but it's an element that at least helps connect the series to the Middle Earth we know. And the fact that two eagles nested on top of the king's tower is actually from the lore again. It's something I was quite disappointed not to see in The Rings of Power. But the entire show was quite a letdown, so them not including the great eagles is a minor thing. Inside the Tower of the King, I wanted to portray Tar Elendil as an old wise king, but also a kind ruler. Someone to remember with fondness. The first thing he shows Aldarion is a map of Numenor, and there's actually a lot of lore behind this. When Numenor sank, there were very few records left, and it's said that there were no accurate maps of the island that survived the downfall. At the same time, this is the early history of Numenor, so it makes sense to start and map out the kingdom, especially with all the growing cities and new settlements. Furthermore, Tarlindel was also called Parmite, which in Quenya means book-handed, and it's something I'll bring up again in a moment. He was given this name because he made many books from the legends and lore gathered by his grandfather, Vardamir Nolimon, the son of Ilros. I also mentioned him briefly in the recap video. Tarlindel actually brings up the fact that he used some of Nolimon's work Talendil mentions that he hasn't seen Aldarion since Eru Hantale. This is one of the three prayers. Now I don't actually explain that in the episode, but we will actually see one of these prayers in a later episode. So I won't go too much into detail about it here. But the three prayers were religious ceremonies in which the Numenorians worshipped Eru. And these ceremonies took place in the spring, midsummer and autumn. And Eru Hantale was in autumn. As it makes sense Aldarion is waiting for spring, to sail to Middle-earth. The King of Numenor plays an important part in the ceremony, but we will experience that in the actual episode. Talendil brings up that Vantur is captain of ships, this is also from the lore, and in the year 600 he sent Vantur to Greyhavens on the ship Entolesse. He then mentions that he would have went with him, which is not from the lore, but simply me playing around with the idea, and there's actually an idea behind this. Elendil means elf friend or star lover in Quenya, 
and his meaning was common among the Edain. So I think it makes sense he got that name from birth, back when the earliest history of Numenor was formed. In proper Quenya though, the name actually means a lover or student of the stars, whereas Elfrend in proper Quenya would be Ildendil. Anyway, I'm playing with the idea of being an Elfrend. I mentioned that he would speak to the elves that visit Eldalonde, one of the western coastal cities on Numenor. The very name actually means Haven of the Eldar. It's a location we'll get back to as a place of vital role in Eldarion's life later on. I think it makes sense that Tarlindel would have been good friends with the visiting elves, and perhaps that is what gave him the idea to renew contact with the elves in Middle-earth. It's indicated that he never went to Middle-earth himself, so I thought it made sense to add that he at least wanted to, but the council was against the idea. And about the council. Its official name is the Council of the Scepter, and was the King's Council. It was comprised of the nobles and lords from each of the six regions of Numenor, who gathered to advise the king on weighty matters of state. When the king proclaimed an heir, they would become a member of the council so as to learn about the government of the land. In addition, the king has the ability to summon others to the council whenever a specific set of knowledge is needed. The council will also play a role later on in the story, but keep them in mind as the story progresses. Let's jump ahead to Tarlendil showing the sword Arandruth. This was the sword of Thingol. If you remember the children of Hurin, you might remember that Beleg went to Thingol before he started to search for Turin. Beleg asked Thingol for a sword of worth for his quest, and the king replied he could have his choice of any except his own. And that sword was Arandruth. The sword later passed on to Elwing, and somehow also ended up in the hands of Elros. We don't know how exactly, and it's not very important for the story. The sword then went on and became an heirloom of Numenor, and each king of Numenor would actually use this sword, so it will actually be present throughout the seasons, at least until the downfall. It belongs to the king of Numenor, and when an heir was appointed, it was customary that he would be handed a new sword, specifically made for him. The sword may not seem that important at this point, and it isn't known to accomplish much, especially in the hands of the kings of Numenor, but it will play a role in this season. Alarion asks if Talalinda regrets that Silmarion was not made the first ruling queen of Numenor. It may not seem important, but it will play a huge role in Eldarion's later life. So this is a very early setup for something that will actually happen, perhaps first in season 2. As I mentioned in the recap, Talalindel gave Silmarion another sword, a scepter of silver and a ring. I could say a lot about the lore behind these three things, but I wanted to keep it secret for now what it is. Talalindel mentions that the council was against the idea of naming Silmarion queen, and this is yet again a setup for something that will happen later. And a final note about Talalindel being called the Bookhanded. I decided to play on that name and actually have him hand a book to Aldarion, and there are several layers of lore here. As mentioned, Talalindel was very interested in history and lore, and would write down a lot of things. So I think it makes sense for him to want to know more about Aldarion's travels, which will also contrast to Meneldur later on. We also know that Eldarion kept record about his voyages. Sadly these books didn't survive the downfall, and that's why we don't know very much about these stories. This lack of knowledge is also what I've used as justification for many of the things that will happen in this season. In broad terms, it will follow the law, but since we know very little about his voyages, there's room for more to be added, and for things to be more detailed. And I think that's one of the more important law elements I've tried to incorporate into the story. So even though you know the voyages of Eldarion, you know far from everything. Not to mention that Tolkien actually never finished the story of Eldarion and Erendis. So I've tried to finish it as well. And here ends the first part of this lore breakdown. It got way longer than first imagined, so I've split it into two parts. I hope to have part two ready very soon. But this also means that episode two will be postponed a week or two. Let me know in the comments if you like the breakdown. And if you want to support the channel, you can become a member join our Discord, or donate directly with the Super Thanks function. As always, thank you all for watching. If you haven't watched the recap yet, I highly recommend you to watch it as well. It will not only give you a deeper understanding of episode 1, but the entire season, perhaps even the entire series. Farewell till next time.